the previous uh, modules we have seen the preparation and uh, in the uh, third module we have so far seen how the materials can be characterized and uh, basically we have grouped it grouped the techniques into three different groups namely diffraction techniques and uh, spectroscopic techniques and microscopic techniques. Uh, in the spectroscopy we have specially looked at uh, two important uh, characterization tools namely x-ray absorption and x-ray uh, in the microscopy techniques uh, we will be specially looking at uh, the range of methods that are available which can be mapped under microscopy namely scanning electron microscopy um, transmission electron microscopy scanning tunneling microscopy and uh, atomic force microscopy. All these are basically imaging techniques they are quite different from the spectroscopic tools, um, but it is impossible to cover all this in one lecture. So, I am going to just give some idea about the tunneling microscopy and force microscopy and uh, in another lecture we can look at the uh, most prevalent uh, spectroscopic tool that is SEM and TEM which is widely used. Just uh, to recap on what we have seen already uh, in materials characterization we basically look at uh, chemistry related tools to evaluate the elemental composition. Uh, titrations are the best uh, chemistry approaches to ascertain whether we are making the right type of material or not. Uh, but when we come to the structure we look at the uh, x-ray diffraction as a major tool both for uh, those working with uh, molecules and those working on solids they heavily rely on x-ray diffraction. We have already seen uh, the principles of x-ray and uh, also uh, <coughs> when we uh, want to look more carefully into the microstructure then we look at the uh, imaging tools. Uh, in today's talk I will be first talking about uh, almost the first um, invention on imaging tools that is uh, scanning tunneling microscope which almost uh, brought a new focus into um, material characterization because until 1986 SEM and TEM were the only tools which were popular to <coughs> study the microstructure of any given solid. Uh, one of the major benefit of this microstructure analysis is to see how the defects are uh, oriented in a given sample. So, mainly uh, the defects in a solid can be mapped using uh, the microscopic tools. So, we will look uh, at the principle of STM. Uh, in this slide I am um, just giving you a brief uh, outline of what this technique is. It looks simple from this diagram, but it can become the most complicated technique in terms of uh, attaining the uh, tunneling condition. Uh, what you see here in this uh, is a tip and this tip is actually made to scan in x y direction and when you scan this in x y direction then you should be able to map the atomic level arrangements and um, to achieve a atomic level uh, mapping of your material you need to have a material or a tip which will also bring about such a resolution and as you would see here from for our naked eye this may look like a pointed tip, but the tip in essence should almost be reduced to a single atom tip and that is the most governing principle of uh, this STM. So, when you bring this tip into such atomic level uh, dimension then a process of tunneling is possible between this tip to the surface which you want to scan and as a result when you attain a tunneling condition then it is possible to generate a topography of the material that you want to study. So, STM is an electron microscope essentially that uses a single atom 
to attain atomic level resolution. Therefore, this is certainly a more refined technique compared to scanning electron microscope. Uh, when good conditions for observations are realized, the magnification that you can achieve is of the order of 10 million times. So, when, uh, when you talk about 10 million times, you are talking about looking at an atom uh, through this probing technique. So, uh, this is one of the most richest information that anyone can get out of scanning tunneling microscope. So, the order of magnification that you can achieve is of a atomic level uh, dimension which is about 10 million times. And uh, what we also look here is for a spatial resolution which is far more important than a magnification power because when we talk about optical microscope or scanning electron microscope we usually look at the magnification, but here we are looking at spatial resolution therefore, this is uh, entirely a different notion altogether in in the microscopic uh, uh, techniques. The size of an atom is actually is measured in angstrom and therefore, one angstrom is a unit of length equal to one tenth of a uh, millionth of a millimeter. So, we are actually going to uh, look at the material in angstrom dimension and this can be achieved by STM. <coughs> this is a um, animation that I just want to show in the beginning itself which can give you some idea. As you would see here, this is a tip which is actually scanning through a array of uh, uh, ordered atoms and uh, this can actually go back and forth into any prescribed uh, area and as you would see here, Th there is a tunneling that is um, achieved between the tip and the surface and uh, this can map and if there is any edges or steps that are uh, possible, the tip can actually adjust itself to probe. Therefore, uh, in, a, in a predominantly flat surface, any corrugations or any step edges that is there, everything can be mapped once you attain or achieve a tunneling probability. So, th um, the machine uh, although it looks very simple, uh, in reality the machine is a, a pain taking effort because uh, this is a ultra high vacuum chamber which is actually having um, the STM features. Uh, so, to get a, a STM uh, image, it is a very costly probe. Uh, nowadays, different forms of scanning probes are coming, where you can even use a scanning probe in uh, in an ambient condition in a laboratory and in a clean uh, clean room atmosphere. But uh, STM essentially calls for a high vacuum environment. Therefore, it's called UHV STM, that is ultra high vacuum STM, and in ultra high vacuum STM most of the time it is only uh, done at room temperature, but today uh, as we are addressing this issue in 2011 we have much more refined techniques where even you can go to liquid nitrogen temperature to probe scanning tunneling microscopic images. So, the instrumentation has become very very extensive and more improvisations are coming and uh, as I uh, go through some more slides, you will understand that now this STM or scanning probe uh, has become a family of uh, techniques. It is not just STM, it has taken upon itself many modifications. Therefore, uh, STM is not a standalone technique, but it is a group of techniques that can be used. So, just to impress upon you that uh, STM by itself is actually a ultra high vacuum uh, probe, but we can also try to do that in ambient condition by modifying this technique. <coughs> now, what what is this uh, STM all about? Uh, we can start with some simple definitions just to highlight the point, um, but let me single out the two um, Nobel laureates who were responsible for bringing this technique and they were awarded Nobel prize in 1986. Uh, 
um, Heinrich Royer and Gerd Binisch. Both these um, scientists uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize for uh, designing this STM. Uh, in, tan uh, in the scanning tunneling microscope, tunneling actually tunneling current starts to flow from a <coughs> sharp tip uh, to a conducting surface at a distance approximately of 1 nanometer. So, that is the tunneling distance and if you look at this graph you would find out that uh, you can play around with a range of current which is your tunneling current and that depends on a very small width of the distance. So, within this small distance you can achieve so, the tunneling current is exponential to the distance between the tunneling tip and the surface and if this tunneling has to happen you need to have both the tip and the surface that you are probing which has to be metallic. You cannot have a non-metal or a insulating compound and therefore, if you have a insulating compound or a biological sample then you need to come out uh, come up with another probe which will help you to do the same atomic level uh, mapping and incidentally that is what AFM is able to do. Atomic force microscope is mainly meant for non-conducting surfaces. So, we, uh, we will go more into this detail as we progress through this uh, lecture. The tip is actually mounted on a piezoelectric tube which allows tiny movement by applying a voltage at its electrodes and uh, the tip position can actually be therefore maneuvered and uh, <coughs> the tip to a surface distance actually can be kept constant. We can vary the tunneling current or we can uh, keep the tunneling current constant and vary the distance and this is actually governed by this notion. So, uh, based on this tunneling probability it is possible to engineer different type of uh, STM arrangement. Um, so, this is the basic principle by which this uh, works out. So, uh, some important features that we can get to know about um, this STM is the tip has to be extremely fine mm. and then um, the electrons actually tunnel between the surface and the tip producing an electric signal and uh, while the scan is going on which has to be very very slow it is not a rapid uh, scan it has to be a very slow scan and when you do that you, you can actually trace the topography of the surface. So, this enables it to follow even the smallest details of the surface as it is scanning. So, uh, three principles that we can uh, come out with one is uh, scanning, one is tunneling and uh, the other one is tip point probing. So, uh, actually the protocol in a scanning tunneling microscope is uh, on the reverse order. First you try to bring the tip uh, in closer proximity to the surface and then you establish a tunneling and once the tunneling uh, is established then you do the scanning. So, these are the three important uh, concepts that you work out during the STM and uh, what is the uniqueness of this STM? Why we need to take such a costly procedure for mapping? because we have already uh, the well established ones that is uh, optical microscopy and then you have S SCM, we have TEM all these are available at a much cheaper rate compared to STM. But if you look at the vertical scale and the lateral scale uh, you can only map those which are above uh, 10 power 6 angstrom. So, anything in a micron scale the SEM, TEM or optical microscope can easily map. Therefore, uh, we have so far been more interested or we are adapted more to materials characterization along this domain. So, SEM, TEM optical microscopy has helped us, but more so in the recent years the shaded area um, this has become point of focus and more so you can find out the spatial resolution that you can achieve from STM is of the order of angstrom and that is why this is positioned somewhere here. So, in comparison to SEM and TEM and other microscopy uh, STM stands out because you are almost taking it near to a 
atomic uh, resolution. So, what is the principle here? Uh, the principle of, of operation of this STM is given in this cartoon where you can see uh, that this tip here is actually mounted on a piezoelectric uh, uh, table with, with the x y arms. So, you have x y and z uh, position. So, this piezoelectric table actually can move this tip in x y direction and this y z direction is given for the tunneling to be established. So, once you establish the tunneling then you can actually move in the x y dimension to any part of the sample what you are looking for and then the control unit actually uh, will take care of uh, applying the current uh, the uh, required voltage for the uh, for sustaining this tunneling to uh, proceed and uh, this is the map which tells you what exactly will happen when this piezoelectric table is moving in the x y direction. So, if this is actually a flat terrace then this dotted line will tell you that uh, the surface is smooth and suppose the crystal has a step edge then the uh, position of this uh, uh, of this tip will move this way and if you see this sort of a movement then you understand that the crystal has a step edge and if you see a bump here a small one then you understand that the surface is inhomogeneous it is not flat or something else is there. So, the way the uh, tip moves will give you all the related information with respect to the surface that you are probing. Now, uh, the principle of tunneling actually uh, we understand that uh, this is totally a quantum phenomena because if it is a classical picture then uh, if there is a barrier and uh, the object which is supposed to tunnel if it is a macroscopic object then it will not tunnel through this barrier. Uh, but if it is a microscopic particle like electron then there is a tunnel effect even through a barrier then it can tunnel through. So, this is the difference between a macroscopic uh, stuff and a microscopic object. So, tunneling is possible even if there is a barrier and this barrier actually width, width of this barrier has to be very small for the tunneling to sustain. So, that is the condition that we try to uh, optimize or we try to achieve when we are doing the tunneling uh, experiments. Now, uh, if you look at this uh, tunneling phenomena, uh, 90 percent of this tunneling current is actually confined to one single atom and uh, that is what we see here. So, this distance d is very important and you will be able to achieve up to 90 percent uh, here and 99 percent of uh, the tunneling current can be confined to just uh, two atom. So, your probe that way has to be very very sharp and it should be very uh, well defined otherwise tunneling cannot be uh, exercised if your uh, uh, tip is not properly done. Therefore, in STM technology uh, tip preparation itself is a costly procedure and uh, if you understand the chemistry of uh, the sample preparation or the tip preparation you will see that it is a simple electrochemical technique that can bring about great results we will see that uh, shortly from now. So, just want to uh, quickly recap uh, what really um, has happened and how much uh, this simple uh, tunneling principle has been carried over. The first experiment that was done by these Nobel laureates was in vacuum between tungsten tip and platinum surface. Uh, that was the breakthrough experiment and we would shortly see uh, some of the images uh, which was brought out by them and uh, so therefore, um, the path breaking discovery led to atomic imaging in real space and uh, not only that the STM paved way to a new family of techniques called scanning probe microscopy. So, SPM is actually the normal way the microscopy is referred to, but it can also accommodate various other uh, tunneling microscopic techniques. In the uh, scanning tunneling microscope the protocol as I told you 
the first one is uh, to do with the uh, sample uh, preparation then tip preparation and uh, this is a real time photograph that was that is taken in a ultra high vacuum environment where you can see the tip is actually approaching the surface of the sample and uh, you can see this tip is actually seeing the mirror image of the uh, of its own as you bring it closer to the surface so with the uh, optical microscope you can actually bring it as close as you can and then you can allow a uh, auto approach for the tunneling to be established so today's experiments uh, allow the tip to do a auto approach you can bring it as close as you can uh, by f uh, by following it through a microscope and then you allow the machine to do the auto approach so that the tunneling will be established once the tunneling is established then you are ready to go for mapping the uh, surface so what you uh, precisely do is cover a lot of frames of this sort of pictures and then you try to analyze that you can uh, you can try to estimate you can try to verify whether the um, uh, whether the images are as expected and then you can do variety of things with every frame that you are recording you can do line scan I will show some of the um, examples of what you can learn from such ACM STM uh, pictures and then finally you can come to a presentation data uh, in three dimension or in two dimension so um, this is exactly the way you go about uh, recording the STM pictures in terms of instrumentation I have told you there are two approaches one is constant height uh, approach otherwise is constant current imaging uh, so if you have your uh, constant height approach then you are actually varying the tunneling uh, current so you just let the tip experience proper tunneling by varying the voltage uh, that you are applying so you keep the distance constant and you only um, vary the tunneling current or you can have the tunneling current established you fix it and let the tip go through the same contour as that of the sample so if the sample is uh, is inhomogeneous in this way the tip will actually be coming and going this fashion and will exactly map the path of your uh, atomic surface so both are um, predominant and uh, sometimes it is always advisable to have a constant current uh, tunneling current and then you let it go through different heights if your uh, sample is dirty and if your sample is not very smooth then in this approach what happens sometimes your tip can actually pick up some dirt or some um, uh, some islands of uh, atoms which otherwise will become very difficult to remove it therefore it's always better to have a much cleaner surface so sample preparation that way becomes a very important uh, issue so this is another cartoon that uh, shows the same um, idea of what this constant current imaging approach uh, means uh, but there is another issue uh, the tip that we saw here uh, this is exactly the way the tip would look for and if this tip is actually of a dimension like this but then your cone uh, angle this cone angle if it is going to be 15 degrees or if it is going to be 5 degrees you can look at the relative influence of your scanning microscopy images because if your uh, cone angle is 15 then if the atomic surface is having this sort of uh, patches then your uh, probing will be incomplete these are areas which will not be mapped by your STM tip because of your cone angle therefore the sharper the cone angle better the lateral resolution so your atomic imaging will be very very sharp if you have a very short cone angle therefore preparation of your tip is very very important <coughs> and uh, this is how you prepare a SE, SEM tip uh, and the SEM tip can be prepared by a simple uh, electrochemical uh, procedure uh, in this case what you see here is a prepared tungsten wire which is held by a 
uh, manipulator and uh, this is actually uh, n protected in air column where as the uh, leaching is done here then it will drop down and you can preserve the uh, tip. Uh, this is the situation after this is leached and it is cleaved. So, when it is actually this area is getting leached here then you can see that you get a very uh, fine tip at this side and this is almost near to a single atom tip, but in reality you never get a single atom tip. So, there are different ways that this can be done, uh, but this is the simplest and cheapest way of preparing a STM tip. So, this is usually uh, engineered uh, uh, for variety of applications. For example, if you are working on a ultra high vacuum condition then tungsten, molybdenum, iridium are the preferred tips. Uh, if you are working in air then it is platinum or uh, gold, uh, platinum, iridium these are used for such procedure and we also have uh, other uh, ways of doing this. The disadvantage of your electro uh, electrolytic method is that there is formation of uh, oxide at the tip. Uh, so, usually uh, ion milling is done in order to prepare the tip you can see this uh, compared to this tip uh, you can get much sharper one by by using ion milling and um, ion milling can actually keep away from other oxidic impurities therefore this is one of the preferred way of uh, doing that uh, this is another uh, technique called electron beam uh, deposition where you you can actually grow the rod on a silicon particle you can grow a tungsten rod which is very very small uh, uh, the thickness of this can be uh, 15 nanometer so you can artificially grow STM tip. Uh, this is the protocol that you uh, usually use when you try to uh, map uh, a surface uh, first the trace can be uh, interpreted as a grid um, and then this is converted into um, a contour map like this and after that this you can try to get uh, images of desired uh, color or uh, shape. So, uh, once you scan through uh, there is a procedure by which we can try to map the um, imaging therefore, this is coming out as a software we will not be looking at, at those details. So, each of this um, scanning is padded up with a uh, software procedure which will give you uh, the pictures uh, the way you, you desire. Uh, there are some calculations that also can be made on every STM topography that we make. I will give you some idea about uh, the applications of STM. Once you probe what is all that you can look for and uh, from our own experience I would like to quote few uh, details. One. Uh, one of the main application of STM is actually in ultra high vacuum uh, environment where you try to uh, control depositions in atomic level. I have already discussed uh, this uh, these slides in module 2 uh, while discussing about uh, molecular beam epitaxy, but today I am going to show some of those uh, results again, uh, but we will tell you how to map those depositions. So, the first application is on surface coverage and uh, another popular area where STM is uh, playing important role is in nano lithography and also we can look at interface effects. So, we will go by some of the applications of this uh, technique. Uh, this is the first uh, STM image that was uh, uh, mapped by uh, the Nobel laureates or the uh, pioneers uh, Binish and Royer, um, they actually sh um, tried to scan the silicon 111 surface and uh, this is a grayscale image which shows that they could find a uh, 7 by 7 reconstruction of a silicon 111 surface. Uh, later with a lot of improvements you can see a much better topography of the same surface. What you see here is nothing but the step edges of a silicon 111. It is cut like this. Typically when you take a STM picture you will get this sort of a um, 
contour and what you see here this is one edge and just below that in one nanometer scale you would see another uh, step edge and below that is another step edge. So, each one is a step and if you suppose go to a small point and then try to look at the atomic level resolution this is what you would observe. So, what you are observing is in a very small area of this terrace you can go um, uh, to very higher spatial resolution where you can see a typical 7 cross 7 reconstruction of silicon in 111 surface. So, these bright spots are nothing but this 7 cross 7 reconstruction that you are saying. So, what in essence you can see is not only a macroscopic image of your crystal, you can also go down to uh, spatial resolution where you can see atom by atom the periodicity and if you if you see any of this reconstructions disordered. So, you can look at the defect ordering in those structures. Not only that if we try to deposit something on the surface then it is possible for you to understand how the deposited material is growing. So, you can look at the coverage. So, this is a clean surface of silicon. So, when you deposit some material then you can map how to um, how to understand the growth mode and how much uh, layer thickness of the deposited material is uh, grown on the surface. So, all this can be verified with the inside to STM probing. Sometimes it is possible to deposit some material and retract the deposition gun and then immediately bring the STM probe and look at the coverage. Sometimes it can be taken inside to to another chamber where you can do the coverage calculation. Uh, this is uh, one of the view graph which I have already shown in uh, module 2, but just to reinforce what uh, information that we can get out of STM. I am showing this uh, copper 111 vicinal surface. This is uh, a very important protocol that that one has to follow when we specially try to make new materials. Uh, this is a very clean surface of copper 111 with the step heights if it is a vicinal copper 111 surface you would actually see the uh, the breadth of this terraces are of this dimension roughly of the order of 10 to 15 nanometers. So, with this sort of vicinal surfaces you are almost forcing a different growth mode for different materials. That is the reason why we go for copper 111. The same material suppose I want to grow iron film on copper 111, the terrace and the morphology of your copper 111 surface will initiate a very different growth process compared to a copper 100 growth process. So, if you want to understand atom in atomic scale how this growth process proceeds then you need a very good understanding of your uh, of uh, the STM. Um, so, STM plays a, a very important role therefore, to uh, dictate the growth mode and uh, what you see here in the inset is nothing but the uh, atomic resolution of this copper 111 surface as you can see here uh, typically this is a 5 cross 5 nanometer uh, image and uh, you almost see no defects in atomic resolution. Therefore, this surface is quite good and we can proceed with depositing any sort of a film on this uh, surface that is the message that you take from this view graph. And uh, what can I do with this uh, from the cartoon that we saw in the earlier slide? We can use the same information and then try to calibrate how the ion is growing on um, this copper 111 surface. As you see here, this is ion on copper grown using a thermal deposition and uh, when you put some ion atoms there is a step decoration that is happening only at the edge of this terraces ion atoms are going and sitting. <coughs> Therefore, uh, for those who are interested in the magnetism of this ion films 
it becomes a very very important information because you are almost successfully making a one dimensional iron stripes one dimensional iron stripes so in this you can see what is the nature of magnetism there but from STM point of view I do not want to discuss the magnetic information but you see here is a line that can be drawn on this topography which is a post uh, analysis you do not usually do this when you are scanning the STM you can save this frame and on this frame you can actually draw a line here like this and that is what you see here this is a line drawn and this line scan is what is given here in the inset. So, what you see here is this is the line that is drawn and on this line you can see uh, sorry the, this, this is the, uh, this is the uh, line that is drawn here and uh, what you see here is uh, some uh, troughs and these troughs mean that between two ion islands there is a break which means the ion atoms are not actually fused together there is a discontinuity so i cannot call this as a ion stripe but it is a uh, one dimensional wire but with discontinuity so if i keep on depositing then this sort of troughs will be missing so then i can say it is a one dimensional wire okay but now it is simply remaining as a one dimensional stripe but it can become a one dimensional wire and as you would see here the length of these wires can be as long as uh, 1000 angstrom or um, 2000 angstrom depending on the uh, continuity of the stripes. Now, what other information that you can get here when you draw the line you can see some sort of white spots there and these white spots clearly say that on the first iron layer there is a second iron atom going and sitting on the top and that can say whether it is truly a one dimensional wire or it is a one dimensional wire with a double layer of iron. So, this mapping you cannot do any otherwise other than with STM therefore, it is important for us to do a line scan in this case. Now, if you improve little bit more on the thickness then you can see that this is only a continuous layer second layer from growing. So, all this information that you can get out of a line scan from a uh, post calibration that you can do while saving this images. Now, the same uh, exa uh, example we can take, but we can try to deposit the iron layers instead of using a thermal deposition technique where you get this sort of one dimensional stripes. We can use a different deposition technique called PLD that is pulse laser deposition and if we try to deposit ion atoms then this is the picture that you get and uh, STM clearly shows that the way the ion atoms are deposited is entirely different from the previous slide that we saw. So, the growth mode depends on the growth uh, technique that you follow uh, from thermal if you go to a more dynamic um, deposition technique which uh, which carries your ion atoms with extra kinetic energy then the growth morphology changes and here is another line scan for such a iron grown film on copper 111 where you can see if I draw a line scan across two three steps this is one step and this is one step and then there is a small step there and then comes another step. So, I am drawing a line scan across four steps then you can see here the step edges are marked by this. So, this might on the whole may look as though it is a inhomogeneous uh, surface, but it is a homogeneous surface, but you can get lot of information about this. So, as you go through this you can find out this is your step edge and then whatever that is happening here this shift corresponds to one monolayer because the variation is from 0.4 to 0.6 nanometer which means only one atomic layer is growing, but there is also another small hump there which corresponds to one more monolayer that means over one of the iron island the second layer is also trying to grow. 
So, this information you can get out of a line scan for a iron film that is grown using pulse laser deposition. This is another example which I have uh, briefly mentioned in module 2 um, which I want to revisit. Suppose I want to make a artificial alloy where I am going to put one layer of uh, iron, one layer of copper, one layer of iron alternatively and keep on growing an artificial alloy because iron and copper are immiscible alloys then I can easily map whether such a alloy can be formed because the first layer what I, what I have deposited here uh, as iron can be seen here. These small dark spots are those first layers which is fully covered by the second layer that is copper and this gray scale is nothing but the second layer. So, in the initial growth mode we can try to map whether it is a continuous growth or whether it is a column growth. So, if it is a two dimensional growth then it is easy for us to map. So, as we are trying to deposit such bilayers of iron and copper you can see from two monolayers to eight monolayers or eighteen to fifty monolayers we can keep on stopping at every region and try to see whether you are able to grow such flat uh, atomic layers to build up a equiatomic uh, iron copper alloy composition. So, that way uh, STM becomes very useful in terms of coverage calculations. We can also try to uh, deposit a variety of other stuff and try to see uh, in atomic uh, resolution whether a periodic ordering is there. This is a surface reconstruction of uh, nickel platinum alloy on nickel 100 surface and as you know this is a FCC lattice and you can easily map whether this is a iron platinum uh, sorry nickel platinum which is growing epitaxially on nickel 100 surface as you could clearly see such ordered nickel platinum alloy can be uh, made in a um, nickel surface. It is also possible to map some adsorbed atoms on nickel. This is a one of a, a good picture which shows how xenon can be adsorbed onto uh, nickel 100 at very low temperatures. It is very difficult to deposit xenon, but xenon when it is when the substrate is cooled at very low temperature it is possible to trap xenon atoms. So, this sort of mapping can also be done and you can also f see that on nickel 100 surface there are some defects which can also be tracked. When you look at phase transformations between iron and uh, iron BCC and iron FCC as you know uh, BCC iron is magnetic, uh, FCC iron is non-magnetic. When you are trying to map the iron films you can easily find out whether there is a transformation from FCC to BCC. As you would see here the angle for this BCC atoms is 71 degrees whereas for FCC it is a 90 degree stripe and therefore if you map this region and this region in atomic scale you can find out this patchy region whatever you see here is totally a BCC ion compared to a FCC ion. So, uh, when you grow such very thin layers it is possible not only from phase contrast, but you can easily pick out from this lattice arrangement and pinpoint which are the regions which have converted from FCC to BCC. So, such conversions can be easily mapped using this resolution. Uh, nano lithography most of the time this view slides are shown as an example where you can actually try to um, decorate any surface the way you want. Therefore, this is one of a very useful uh, technology by which lithography can be engineered. Uh, as you see here in a surface you can bring your STM tip you can actually capture some material and then you can go and with forward or reverse bias you can try to dump that material onto a surface that you are desiring. By this way you can actually grow a coral or, or a decoration on a particular surface. So, this is possible because you can actually take some ad atoms 
on to the STM tip and then by way of uh, applying the voltage you can dump those uh, sticking atoms to the surface and uh, such uh, techniques are useful to, um, to make any sort of uh, device applications and this is one of the example where a guy who was hired by IBM was successful to capture um, xenon on nickel. So, this blue dots are nothing but xenon which he could just pick up from the STM tip and go and exactly decorate a, a IBM um, a letter on a nickel surface. So, uh, this can play a very crucial role that way in doing nano lithography and this is one of the most popular cartoon which is shown in almost all the STM uh, lectures. Uh, here is one uh, coral uh, surface which shows how uh, iron atoms can be grown on copper and each one is a iron island which can be uh, properly placed using a STM tip. So, uh, several such things can be done. This is a 48 uh, uh, iron atom coral which is uh, dumped on a copper surface and this is again uh, done by the same group. Uh, so, several things can happen. Um, we can also try to map uh, how the interfaces are ordered uh, in, a, um, in a situation where you are growing two different materials. For example, you take gallium antimonide and uh, indium arsenide and when you are growing a, a multi-layer, you can get a STM image of this contrast. What you are seeing here is gallium antimonide which is a 12 monolayer uh, stuff and uh, this is packed between or sandwiched between 14 monolayer indium arsenide. As you can see here the repeat is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 which corresponds to actually 14 monolayers of indium arsenide and uh, 6 uh, such uh, maximas are there corresponding to 12 gallium uh, antimony uh, layers. So, you can essentially map how this interfaces are growing and you can see each one is a repeat. So, you try to first grow gallium arsenide then indium as a gallium antimonide, indium arsenide and so on and uh, one can also find out how sharp these interfaces are because you can see in some cases uh, the antimony is uh, actually coming out into the indium arsenide layers. So, uh, especially in semiconductor physics this interdiffusion of antimony or arsenide is very very detrimental therefore, STM can map and tell you whether you are growing sharp interfaces or not. So, this is very vital and in this case what is actually seen is not the gallium in indium ions it is just the arsenide and um, antimony uh, layers that you can see here. Uh, now, when we have a problem in trying to uh, study uh, non-conducting materials, what do we do? In that case, uh, uh, another uh, <coughs> technique uh, which, which comes handy is AFM. Uh, now, AFM is there more than STM because most of the labs can afford a AFM. Uh, main reason you do not need a ultra high vacuum condition and second you can actually keep it in a very small place, it does not come and that much of attention as the STM. So, atomic force microscopy was developed 2 or 3 years later um, after the STM was discovered. Now, here the principle is very simple where you are trying to use a cantilever where you, which houses a tip and this tip actually is scanned uh, across the surface and if there is any uh, ups or downs in the surface then the deflection in the cantilever is photo detected using a laser beam. A laser beam is actually uh, falling on the cantilever and any deflection that is actually seen and this can actually be traced as a, a topographic. Therefore, the same information that you get from STM you can also get out of a AFM. Only thing here we do not look at the tunneling probability. There is no tunneling here. It is just a simple micro tip which is actually scanning across a surface and the way the topography is uh, contoured here is based on a laser beam deflection which is monitored by a photo detector. So, this is the principle. So, this gives a luxury for 
uh, most of the experimental uh, people to study their uh, materials uh, and especially if they want to look at the atomic scale resolution. There are several things uh, that we can talk about the way the AFM tips that are made also is equally important and it is a challenging task as that of uh, STM. Uh, this is typically a um, contour that you can uh, generate out of a AFM uh, microscope. Uh, what you see here is a pyrolytic graphite uh, graphitic structure and uh, this uh, tip actually uh, scans through and there are different ways that you can scan this topography. One is uh, using a constant mode um, or a non uh, sorry contact mode another one is a non contact mode or the other one is a tapping mode usually tapping mode is uh, preferred or uh, which was the first generation AFM uh, which actually keeps tapping and uh, mapping the atomic uh, um, arrangement. Uh, one problem with the contact mode is that it uh, although it has a high resolution it will destroy or damage the sample. Non-contact mode gives a luxury of not corrupting your sample but then suffers from resolution and the tapping mode is uh, better resolution but with minimum damage. But during tapping mode or contact mode you can also get many other um, informations which is actually based on frictions. So, when you have a tip and then you scan it through it will actually drag, drag through the atomic periodicity, but because of the frictional exercise you can actually bring about more information on the atomic arrangement. So, we will see that example later. The principle of operation as I have told you is uh, based on a cantilever. So, this can be used for atomic level imaging and then uh, this is the basic principle of your force microscopy. We can actually detect the forces between a mass attached to a spring that feels uh, some force when it is brought very close to the surface. Ideally the mass would not damage the surface and the sensor that responds to a force and a detector uh, that measures it. Uh, in this uh, force microscopy the numbers that we need to understand is to do with the force constant. So, the frequency of the atoms uh, vibration is roughly of the order of 10 power 15 hertz and the mass of an atom is of this. Therefore, your spring constant is roughly of 1 Newton per meter. We also uh, can extend the same uh, AFM principle to understand how the uh, at lattice arrangements are uh, placed and uh, this is uh, an improvised technique of your atomic force microscope which is called friction microscope. If you scan through a, a sodium chloride lattice you can actually see the kinetic friction is actually averaged out therefore it is 0. But once you place a load on your cantilever then you can see that when it is actually placed on, a, on the top of a, a atom then it will actually take a, a frictional force until uh, it is moved to the other atom which will come out as a jump. So, either you scan it from left to right or right to left you will actually almost generate a, a hysteresis and this is the principle of the frictional force microscopy that you use to contour how the atomic arrangements are placed. For example, if you take the case of sodium chloride you can see that the atomic ordering is periodic and therefore, you get a image out of this using a frictional force microscopic and for a copper 111 again you see a similar uh, periodicity, but whereas if you go for copper 100 you see a irregular lattice spacing. So, that clearly represents what sort of atomic uh, arrangement that you can uh, sense. Lastly, I just want to cover with one um, animation. This is uh, another improved um, SPM probe which is called as spin polarized scanning tunneling microscopy where the tip you can see has a magnetic tip. It is not just a metal, but it is a magnetic tip 
and this will keep sending the conduction electrons to the surface and the surface here is nothing but a manganese antiferromagnetic surface where every other manganese atom is antiferromagnetically arranged. So, the way the conduction electrons goes from the magnetic uh, tip to the atomic periodicity is different. So, as a result if it scans layer by layer or every at atomic um, arrangement then it will easily map the regions which are ferromagnetically aligned to the magnetic tip and antiferromagnetically aligned to the magnetic tip. As a result you will get a topography almost similar to this. The brighter areas represent the ferromagnetic alignment with respect to the tip and the darker areas will actually represent the antiferromagnetically aligned region. So, if you have a magnetic tip then it is possible for you to map a antiferromagnetic image and this is how it will proceed finally you will get a topography like this which will give you a dark and white pattern which will clearly say that your surface is a antiferromagnetic surface. So, this much information you can get and uh, just to sum up uh, want to say that uh, there are different phases of scanning uh, probe microscopy one we looked at the STM uh, another one we looked at the AFM and then we looked at the frictional force microscopy and there are a lot more coming in the form of magnetic force microscopy popularly known as MFM. We can study spin polarized tunneling also. So, any sort of images can be made. I have particularly avoided showing some classic examples where you can even probe biological samples, but for our course this is important to understand that any sort of uh, inorganic materials can be mapped using STM.